Hello, everyone. Welcome to Northrop and our online residency with Ragamala. My name is Kristen Brogdon, and I'm Northrop's Director of Programming. It's a pleasure to welcome you here with us today. I want to share our thanks to Dartmouth for creating the original video for this event, produced by the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth as part of Hop at Home back in May 2020. Both Pico Iyer and Ragamala have been involved in a residency at Dartmouth, which was the impetus for the original conversation. When we were talking with Ragamala about our Twin Cities residency, we realized this would still be a great way to provide some additional context and conversation about Varanasi for our audiences. So today we have a rebroadcast of their video conversation interspersed with some of our own question and answers and reflection on themes of the work. We are also delighted to welcome another Fires of Varanasi commissioning partner into this event and to welcome Alicia Adams and the Kennedy Center audiences, uh, the Kennedy Center, which is my former artistic and professional home as well. Thanks also to our colleagues at the Kennedy Center for their work on the video for tonight's event. Those of you watching in real time will have the chance to chat with each other and also ask questions of the Ragamala artistic directors. We encourage you to use the chat function, which is on your Zoom menu bar, usually at the bottom of your computer screen or at the top of your mobile device. You can use that chat function to introduce yourselves, where you're watching from, discuss the topics with each other. And then you can use the Q&A box, which is also in that Zoom menu bar um, next to where you'll find the chat for your formal questions for the artistic directors. So at this point, we are going to, to get started with our pre-recorded conversation, and then I will be back with Rani Annapurna Ramaswamy, the Artistic Directors of Ragamala, and Alicia Adams, the Vice President for International Programming at the Kennedy Center, for some live Q&A after this first section. Enjoy. Hi, Pico. Hi, nice to see you again. Very, very nice to see you and to be here. I think I... Just to introduce myself to the audience, if they don't know, um, I, as you were saying, I've been a writer for 38 years now, writing nonfiction and novels and essays and screenplays, everything possible. And I've been living in suburban Japan 32 years, but much more to the point, I'm so excited. I'm coming to Dartmouth for the first time ever this October to be a Montgomery Fellow. And I couldn't believe the serendipity or magic when I found that both of you are coming to Dartmouth more or less in the same season and we get to converge there too. You are absolutely correct that it is so serendipitous that we all have a connection to Dartmouth in these, these years and at this time. Dartmouth is commissioning and the Hopkins Center at Dartmouth is commissioning our newest dance work, The Fires of Varanasi. And so it just was an incredible coincidence when we expressed to Mary Lou what fans we are of, of you and your writing. And she suggested that perhaps there was some way that we could all connect. Now, reading your writing, I found that there are similarities between your writing and our form of dance, which is Bharatanatyam from the Southern um, art of India. So Bharatanatyam is like a yoga, which is where you seek stillness and concentration while all your senses are working and your feet, you're, you're moving them rhythmically, your arms, you're telling a story, you are communicating with the audience, but at the same time, you're also finding that stillness. You often write and speak about stillness in your articles and in your book. Um, and could you talk a little bit about how you find that in your writing? <laughs> well, I think many people associate me with travel and I've been lucky to travel around the world quite a bit. But for every 10 days I spend in Varanasi, for example, I spend probably 10 weeks back at home. And every writer, but I think every artist, I'm sure you too, um, know that really one prepares oneself for work, one makes sense of it, one decides where to go by sitting very, very still. It's like breathing in and, and breathing out. And I often feel that we can only really be moved when we're sitting still. So all the physical movement I've done in my life is just really a preparation for sitting very still and trying to awaken new continents inside myself. Um, but I think we'll be coming back to that in a little bit. And in the meantime, I just want to say how really honored I am to talk to both of you. I never forget uh, our meeting 
uh, in Chicago in 2010 uh, at the annual conference of Dance USA. I'm somebody who can barely walk across the room without falling on my face, so I didn't know I'd been invited to a dance conference. And I think when I first met you briefly in Chicago, you, Aparna, said that certain things I'd said about home resonated with you. And I'm wondering if you remember what that might be. That day you spoke about your very unique background and how it has really influenced your perspective and your writing and how notions of home and identity are fluid and how they spark creativity with all of us. And with those words, it really did set me on a new path because as a person who was born in India and raised in the United States, I did spend four months a year growing up in India, so I really find myself always calling myself as having lived a dual existence. And I found myself always, however, thinking of my life as two points, running from one point rapidly towards another point, and forgetting what came in between. And with your words, what, I, what it really made me think about is the importance of that journey in between two points and how that journey really is the bedrock of my practice. I would love for you to talk about your hybrid background and the, how that has influenced your perspective of the world and your writing as well. It really strikes me that in the 21st century, so many people are living, as you said, in the passageways between places, the conspiracies between places, the, the mutual fascination between different parts of the globe. And I think just as for both of you in different ways, for me, home has always been almost a mosaic of all the different places and people that have made me up. And it's almost like a, a stained glass hole, but one that's, that's shifting. Um, so in a very practical way, again, like both of you, I was born in Oxford, England, to parents, both of whom were from India, but my mother was from North India, my father was from South India, and so actually their only common language was English. I never even heard any of India's languages spoken as a little boy. And then when I was seven years old, um, we moved to California. So suddenly I was this funny little boy with an Indian face and an English voice and an American green card. And I think even then, as you were saying about you having two homes, I was thinking, how lucky and unusual I am because I have three hopes and I can bring them into different combinations. I can mix and match. I can see California with Indian eyes and see India with English eyes. And when I visit Japan, say, I can see things in a different way because I'm bringing three sets of eyes to this. And I think growing up in the 1960s in England, I actually never saw another dark skinned person. England was very homogeneous then. And so my position seemed so uncommon. And I never could have guessed that within a couple of generations, it would almost become the norm. I think if I were in Minneapolis now or Hanover or certainly London or Sydney or Toronto, most of the kids I meet would be much more international than I am. And they would think, oh, you only have three cultures. You, you're such a simple person. And so, yes, I've always felt that home has much less to do with where you come from than where you're going in some ways. That's the important thing. But having said all that, um, it really, as it were, came home to me one day, many years ago, I was in my family home here in California, and I saw this distant line of orange cutting through a hillside. And so I went down to call the fire department. And when I came up again, um, our house was completely encircled by 70 foot flames in what was at that point the worst forest fire in Californian history. And so three hours later, our house, every last thing in it, except for me and my mother's cat, was raised to the ground, reduced to ash. And that night I went to sleep on a friend's floor and I went to a supermarket and I bought a toothbrush. And that was really the only thing I had in the world. And so literally the next morning when I woke up, if somebody said to me, where's your home? I couldn't point to any physical construction. My home would have to be whatever I carried around inside me. And that really confirmed that lifelong intuition that Home is not, as you were saying, where you live, it's what lives inside you. I was brought up in a very secluded, guarded, avoid of any Western influence at home. Learning music, classical South Indian dance, learning mantras, cooking, but also sent to a 
Catholic convent run by European nuns. So there I spoke English and I had friends who were Christian, Muslim, Jain, Hindu, and read Arthur Haley and listened to um, the Beatles where my parents were not listening and then coming home and reading the Mahabharata and Ramayana. When we moved to this country as first generation immigrants from India, we lived a very typical immigrant life where you feel that you are more an observer than a participant. And when I was eight years old, we met our teacher, Alamel Wali, here in Minnesota. So if you hear about a mother and daughter with our backgrounds creating, it would be natural to assume that Rani would look back at her tradition and want to create in, um, in that way, and that I would perhaps find themes from my American life to create. But we're exactly the opposite. As Rani said, she found so much curiosity in the collaborative potential here in the United States. And I took my deep desire for my Indian culture and to mine the, the literature and the poetry, the music and the dance of India. It's fascinating. Um, and as I was listening to you, I was thinking my mother, sorry clad mother, who has spent her first 21 years in India and then went to England and then came here, only learned Sanskrit when she arrived in California and then became a professor of Sanskrit here in California. All right, let's welcome our guests live into the conversation. So Aparna and Rani Ramaswamy, artistic directors of Ragamala, and Alicia Adams, the Vice President for International Programs at the Kennedy Center. Welcome to all three of you here, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. Delighted. So I think in between the sections of conversation between you and Pico, Alicia and I will kind of um, chime in with with some questions for you. Um, I'll get things started. Just um, one of the things that struck me when I was watching this again is Pico's story about the wildfire and how its destruction really changed his concept of home. And um, you know, now these California wildfires are a yearly occurrence, but it also like fire is a part of the life cycle that you're exploring as a part of this piece. So um, what are your thoughts about fire and its place in the life cycle and its place in our world today? Um, let me start with, in Hinduism, everything is personified. So fire is Agni and he is a God that receives and also is a messenger connecting the earth and the heavens. So we actually do all rituals in front of a fire. I remember growing up in India, in the living room, priests would come almost every four or five times a year and build a, a small fire right in the middle of the living room. They would use uh, some bricks and a very special grass. They will offer prayers, light the fire, and after the ritual, they turn it off and say another prayer. And similarly, in my grandmother's house, every night before she went to bed, she would do a small rice flower drawing in front of the wood um, fire um, stove and pray for that fire that helped her cook. So, and fire is used in every ritual and it's a witness in front of marriages and also in we have our um, cremation ceremonies. But these are summoned fires. So they come, they are made with care, with prayer, they're turned off with prayer. Now we, are, we were watching the terrible fires that are happening in California with so much destruction. And I personally, I feel that there, we might be human greed might have to do something about it. Um, when we were at um, Bellagio a couple of years ago, an oceanographer, scientist, Paul Falkowski spoke about um, this idea of nature that God has given us in abundance and with no cost, free for all of us. Yet humans have a tendency to control to put a price and say who or who should or shouldn't use it. And in some ways he said, if we do not replace all of these uh, 
taken things, we are going to soon lose and have a terrible um, future. So in, as I said, the personification of various elements, whether it's fire or water, it actually brings a lot of divinity into nature. And we see um, that, and that's what has, has helped us in this work. And we bring all of that in our production of Fires of Varanasi. Do you want to add anything to oh, that? May I, may I add something to that? Yes. Yes. You're absolutely right, Kristen. That is just such an incredible story. And the resilience that we learn from that is, is very moving. And our hearts go out to everybody uh, who is really has suffered from the devastation. And something that it, it made me think about is that in Hindu philosophy, we learn that the five elements so fire, air, earth, water, and ether make up the foundation of our entire universe. And so each of us and plants and our internal thoughts, our emotions are all made up of a perfect balance of those emotions. And so as Ronnie said specifically to fire, the funerary fires don't just take our bodies, they take our experiences and our thoughts and our joys along with them. Yet the elements that are within our bodies are transferred to another body. And so through this and through what Ronnie was talking about, we see how the relationship between humans and nature and the deification of natural forces in Hindu thought is so current and present and remains so through all of the reading that we're doing and through our daily lives and the sharing of stories. And so what we're reminded of is the other side of that, which is humans are charged with keeping those elements in balance. And so when we have a situation like we do now, that of violence and chaos, and we see that the imbalance is really reigning. And so we see this hypocrisy and pollution and this sort of devastation. And so there are many, just to wrap up really quickly, sorry, I feel like there's so much to say about this because we've really been living in this situation for, for a long time now, but there are scholars who are not just writing about Hindu philosophy, but really writing about how that can be a call to action and how we can use thought like dharmic thought, which is our acts of justice to strengthen our community. And that exists in all of our ancient writing too, and how we can use that now to solve our contemporary problems. And the sharing of art and stories is one part of that. Well, thank you for that answer. And, and I think that all of us are happy to hear the full depth of, of what you have to say. So thank you for that. Alicia, did you have anything that you wanted to ask? Oh. Those are such beautiful descriptions and um, stories that you were just telling about the, about the fires and about really about death too, the, the cremation and, and all. And I was fascinated with what Pico said about identities and about home being a mosaic. And what I, I've watched your dance for a, a long, long time, and it certainly is a, a mosaic. Um, the choreography is certainly not uh, strict Bharatanatyam, but it is, is, a, is, a, is a hybrid. Um, it's American, it's Indian. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how you do choreograph and if you choreograph to, uh, together, and also just why you chose this theme. Sure, do you want me to answer the first yes, part? Yes, I can answer the first part. Um, thank you so much for your question, Alicia. Mm -hmm. We have been um, so honored to perform at the Kennedy Center now, I think three times, and this will be our fourth, so we're very much looking forward to it. And I think you are correct that our choreography and our productions are uniquely American because I think we are emblematic of the American story where we come from India, we have made our lives here, but the work we do is a hybrid, as you say, of both cultures. And the choreography itself, the movement and the language that we use of Bharatanatyam, I would say is very much rigorous Bharatanatyam. It's very true to the language as we studied it. But in our construction is, is where it becomes very uniquely ours. 
ours. And our expression of that is is really expressed through the themes that we choose. We choose themes that we feel are not a representation of one story or one situation, but situations of human emotion or humanity that we feel can be expressed through the telling of various stories or the layering and stitching together of various narratives. And that has really become the way that we create in the last many, many years is through our reading and through our research and finding poetry and music that moves us and making this work that really does bring it all together in order to tell the story that we want to tell of who we are in, in this world and the influences that, that we share with, with everybody. So I can say that that's a, a brief description of the way that we create work. And I think the question of why did we choose the fires of Varanasi? Um, I think that the, the city of Varanasi or Kashi has always been a very, very deeply spiritual place for Hindus and for me growing up in India. But when my father passed away, and being a very staunch, traditional male Hindu, he really wanted his ashes to be in the, in the Ganges. So when we, he died here in the United States, but my brother made sure that his ashes were taken to Varanasi and you know put in the river Ganges. So somehow I feel that place is not somewhere else, but part of it is within us. My father is part of that, that sacred river that we think of as a mother. Now, the also, um, I was going to, my line of thought is a little bit, um, this idea of past and present, like everything you see in Varanasi has a connection to the past. Every movement, every act, every action. And it's just so unique to, um, to this world that we felt that to make a mural-like production where everything is both, it's, there is duality in everything that you will see, that we are doing it now, but it's informed by the past. How, is, how are the myths connected? So it's become a really interesting um, storytelling um, of a whole culture that we, that we come from. So that's, and, the, and that is what um, the, the impetus for the show came from. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that is a nice point for us to return back to your conversation with Pico. So we'll go to the next section of the video and then come back and talk with you again. Thanks. For those of you who've never been to Varanasi, the reason I titled my essay, Flames of Heaven, is that when you walk through this central holy city of Hinduism in Northern India, at its heart is the river Ganges. And it stretches for three miles. And at one end are the bonfires on which dead bodies are being burnt so that the ashes can be committed instantly to the river. So right along the river, in one place, a hundred bodies are burnt every day. And sometimes you'll go there, there are six or seven bonfires, but constantly, round the clock, 24 hours, bodies, dead bodies are being carried to be burnt along the river. So visually, the main image at nighttime when you walk along the river in Varanasi are just of these huge fires burning, consuming dead bodies, that will be sent back into the river and enter the cycle of reincarnation and maybe of liberation too. So you can't go to Varanasi without being struck by the fact it's a city of fire. And that's the image that literally burns itself into your memory. As you know, and as we've said many times, you're writing about Varanasi, specifically your article Maximum India, has very much influenced our imagination and our thinking of and drawing upon images for our stage work, Fires of Varanasi. In your article, you brought the city to such delightful life, and you've written so eloquently about the Varanasi of today, 
but then you purposefully weave together the philosophical and the mysterious undercurrents of that city. Thank you. I love that word, mysterious. And I think one of the first things that really startled me about uh, Varanasi, I think every visitor says the same thing. It's India to the max. It's confusion, noise, intensity, shocking, unsettling, powerful, all at once, like a, a hallucination, almost. But what really struck me was that this city of death, in some ways, was a city of light. And I think I found out that Varanasi's original name was Kashi, which means city of light. And also that this city of death was a city of joy. And what struck me as I was walking around the very narrow passageways of the old city was that people would constantly, as you know, keep running through those passageways, carrying stretchers with dead or dying bodies on them. But they were singing with joy. Um, there were gold shawls over the bodies. There was nothing about mournfulness. It was much more a celebration and um, delight in the fact that these fortunate bodies were able to, um, to be burned next to the sacred river. And I think traditional Hindus would say, therefore, to receive moksha, liberation. And, and um, therefore, in so many ways, Varanasi turns one on one's head and turns one's ideas on one's head. Now for you, because your connections with your roots are much stronger than mine, when you went to Varanasi, it must have been a different experience. You weren't yeah. newcomers the way I was. I was there more as a taking in artistic images than being a pilgrim. What touched me was to see the pilgrims that were so deeply engaged in their prayers, in their inward thinking. Now, the most beautiful thing I witnessed was, was standing by the Ganges at 4 a.m. in the morning and watching life go by. You know, children were playing in the water, people bathing, and all my life I have heard the word Ganga said with such reverence. All of us have little containers of water in our homes ready to be poured into the dying people's lip when there are older people in the home. And here, the mythology was right in front of you. And to then later when my, you know, traditionally it's the boys, not the girls that do the uh, death ceremony for their parents. So my brother, traditionally, he cremated the body of my dad and he took him to took the ashes to the Ganges and scattered it there. And it makes me feel so happy that my father is part of that mythology. Death, which we're so apt to think of as the end of things and mm -hmm. as a moment of sadness, there seemed to be a moment of jubilation and the beginning of many things too, especially if you believe in reincarnation. And I also love the way that this holy city magnetizes people of every kind of faith. I was just remembering this morning, there were 1400 mosques in Varanasi and I saw people taking off on the Hajj. Um, the Buddha delivered his first discourse six miles from Varanasi in the Deer Park in Sarnath. So it's one of these spiritual centers and it's like a spell. When, when you're there, I just um, didn't know how to, to get out of it. I think the great musicians of India, the great philosophers, they've all come from and returned to um, Varanasi. So for me, it was um, a way to encounter the Hinduism of my birth that I've never known enough about. As I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, oh, I am burning to ask this question because these are very philosophical, metaphysical ideas. How do you embody them? Yes. As physical beings. So in Bharatanatyam, we have a saying that a dancer experiences so many emotions during one performance that she will never be reincarnated. She will never come back to this earth. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, in some sense, our dance connects joy and death. Mm -hmm. In so many of our pieces, we represent the soul yearning joyfully for transcendence and union with the divine. Again, that is a complete joyful participation, as you say. <laughs> And yeah. so in this piece, we are very interested in sharing that yearning and that immediacy and that fervor of transcendence and of seeking and that joyful union that we all hope to have. And this is actually 
these are principles and feelings and I would say deep longing that exists in so much of our Indian music and our Indian poetry that it's a very comfortable thought for Indians, this idea of joy and longing and fervor. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in this piece that we're creating, we are using some poetry by a 6th century South Indian, a Tamilian female saint poet. Her name is Kare Kal Amayar, and she comes from the Bhakti tradition. And her poetry is about her deep longing for the deity Shiva, as you said, the mm -hmm. reigning deity of Varanasi. And she longs to shed all of her attachments, her body, her gender, even her skin, so she can become the essence of that longing itself. However, she also oscillates between demanding attention from the divine and becoming uh, subservient to the divine, showing that she has an extremely personal relationship and she traverses all of those aspects of and the nuances of that relationship with the divine. Mm. I love that you brought the word longing into this because that's that's the heart of everything, really. Um, it's beautiful. And it, it also speaks for that sense. I was saying that we define ourselves by where we're going, what we're longing for, the place we want to be, as much as just the house where we happen to grow up. Diane Eck, Varanasi scholar, writes that for Hindus, death is not the opposite of life, rather the opposite of birth. And you say in your writing, it is similar to leaving a cinema by a different door than the one you came in by. The book you generously mentioned, Autumn Light, as you remember, it begins with my father-in-law's death, the death of my Japanese father-in-law. And what struck me, because I'd never witnessed a Japanese funeral before, and maybe this is akin to what you experienced in Varanasi, was that um, after he died, we had a big meal with his body right in the middle. People gave him his favorite kind of beer, served him his favorite food. Seven years on now, it's seven years since he died, every morning my wife wakes up very, very early. She prepares his favorite kind of tea and his favorite snack and puts it out for him in the household altar. As soon as his body was cremated, this is an unusual custom in Japan, all the family members gather with chopsticks and with delight and gratitude, and they pick out bones to keep in their household altars. Very much giving them the sense, as, as you said in the quote from Diana Eck, the dead haven't gone away. They're just in, a, in another room. They're in another state of being, but they're very much with us. And after my wife lost her father, he was probably more present to her even than when he'd been alive. She was, she'd literally dream about him and feel that she, he was walking and, and talking um, through her. Alicia, would you like to go first with the question this time? Sure. I, I love the, the image that Pico gave of Varanasi as, as being, um, we called it Maximum India. Um, uh, I did a festival that I titled Maximum India because I think that India is just over the top in, in terms of, of everything. Um, the, the theme of, of water, you, you did another piece called Written in Water. And this is the fires of Varanasi that has to do with the, with the Ganges. Is there something about the, the two um, in terms of uh, contemporary dance and contemporary Indian dance that you are trying to tell a story about? How do they compare? Okay. So well, what I would say is that returning to this idea of, of themes of nature and our relationship with nature. It's something that we come across so much as the divine as nature, our emotions as nature, nature as a way to so beautifully describe something in metaphor that perhaps we cannot uh, adequately explain for ourselves. And so we find so much metaphor there. And we find the symbol of water in this piece as a life-giving force. Yet it's not static or stagnant. The idea of water as a force, as water as comfort, water as 
fully embracing as immersive. I think there are so many personalities that one can attribute to that. And so with both of those performances, and actually we had a third, Era Sacred Waters, many years ago as yeah. well. So um, if we've always been so fascinated because there are deities that embody that are embodied by the water there are again like i said emotions there are so many so many different things one can express i think we found so many fascinating songs and poems and stories that we have wanted to explore Annie, I have a question for you. you. You talk about how your brother was the one responsible for cremating your father and taking yeah. his ashes to, to the Ganges, and you have two daughters. I'm wondering if it's a conversation that you all have had about gender as it relates to those rituals, and, and if so, if there's anything that, that you would um, be willing to share with us about that. Sure. Um, now, the, in, in, it's a all the beliefs, several beliefs and the practices in Hinduism actually come, they're all ancient, but the religion itself is so flexible that it can move and change to suit the practicing people and places. My father was somehow, he was very much, he was an upholder of rituals and he believed that if you didn't have a son, you're a sinner. I remember how shocked he was when Ashwini was born. He just sat his hand on his head because the astrologer had said, I would have a boy and a girl. What are you going to do? You have two daughters. Because daughters were always considered as um, um, a liability in those days. So even though the last 10 years of his life, I took care of him, he was at peace knowing that my brother would do his final rites. But for me, I have two beautiful daughters who are an asset to me and living in the United States. And I'm also, uh, uh, my Hinduism is more based on the, on the psycho philosophical and artistic aspect of Hinduism. And I would love I mean, I know that they would take care of my final rites. We haven't spoken about it, but it will definitely be cremation. And I would be happy to end up at Lake Harriet if the, <laughs> I don't know what the rules are about putting the ashes in that river, in that lake. But in again, any body of water becomes the Ganges when you really believe it is. So it is symbolism that... Um, it, it is not it, that all that all of nature is divine, and every water is the Ganges. If that's what you believe in. Okay. Thank you for that answer. I think we'll get back to the conversation with Pico so that we can have some time for our audience questions in between. So, so let's go back to that now. Thank you. So as I was listening to both of you talk, and especially as you were evoking for me um, the fires of Varanasi, I was thinking that for a writer, so I do nearly all my, my work by myself uh, at my desk in the middle of nowhere. And the writer's job is to, perform, is to perform as little as possible and to confess as much as possible. In other words, he doesn't want to be playing to a crowd. He wants to be whispering secrets that may be unknown even to himself to something uh, beyond him. He doesn't, he has, the writing is strong in proportion to the fact that it's not on stage, but it's a very, very private thing that even the writer may be surprised by. Your work needs an audience and your audience in South India would know a lot about Bharat Natyam and what is behind it. Your audiences in Minneapolis or New Hampshire may be less so. Are there things that you do to bring yourself to that state where transcendence is a greater possibility? You know, Pico, it's what you're describing is so similar to our process as well. Your desk for instead of a desk, we have a studio. And mm -hmm. every day when we are there by ourselves, uh, there are days when, as you say, you may surprise yourself. There are days where you forget oneself. It becomes a meditation and a prayer, and it becomes a space for limitless joy and frustration. 
But yes. all of yes. those are, are very honest and truthful states of being, and that's what we hope to bring during our performances. So as you say, it's much less of a performance and much more of an honest communication with mm -hmm. the world around us and the people in that room. So mm -hmm. when we are performing, when we're preparing, and the preparation for us is also a physical preparation where we are getting into the makeup and the costume, and that takes about three hours for us. And if you think of it as that is our opportunity to transform from our regular <coughs> selves into perhaps becoming a medium where we can communicate between this world and with the divine. Thank you. Gosh, that's a radiant answer. Um, sometimes I'll tell my friends, well, I, I feel abashed because I've never meditated in my life. And if my wife is around, she'll fall around laughing. And she says, all you do every morning, you get up, you go to your desk, you just sit there for five hours, not moving. If that's not meditation, I don't know what is. And that in some ways, writing is my spiritual practice. And just as you be so beautifully said with your dance, you're trying to um, make a space for the divine to speak through you and to, to visit everybody around you. During this curious moment of um, COVID-19, I felt embarrassed in some ways because my life continues very much um, as it always does. Uh, I practice social distancing for a living more or less and every day I'm just in my house writing, taking a couple of walks, reading, and spending time with my wife. And so I do, my life today is very similar to my life a year ago or 10 years ago, or I hope 10 years from now. I think of your lives as to some extent requiring an audience and needing to share your art with everybody. So has it been difficult for you first to practice and then also to visualize your dances in this time when you have probably no contact with an audience for many weeks? The isolation seems like a place for reflection, it's a space for reflection. The, and I think someone asked, you know, how, how, how can you be global when we are all isolated? But I think this is the time when globalization, we are post global at this moment. We are in conversation with our lighting designer, set designer who lives in France. Our musicians live in India. A composer lives in a different part of India. A couple of our dancers live in Maryland and North Carolina. And we are still having rehearsals through using um, Zoom. Yes, you're so right. And I remember, I mean, in the last few years, all I've been hearing from my friends is I'm overwhelmed. I don't have enough time to contact my friends. I never get to see my family. I never get to take a walk or read a book or, um, or listen to music or attend a dance performance. And as you say, this moment suddenly has given us the chance that something inside us has been longing for, has been aching for, uh, without which we're really insufficient. And I think more and more people now are saying, that this enforced pause is the perfect moment to rethink our habits and to remember our priorities, what really we love and what sustains us, and then to reorient our lives, to include more of, of that element and to make sure that we're making a life as well as making a living. Um, and six years ago, the people who ran the TED Talks asked me to write a little book called um, The Art of Stillness, precisely because they realized that stillness is what most of us didn't have enough of in our lives and was craving. I so loved what Rani was saying um, about this is the global moment, partly because you really are working with colleagues everywhere in the world, but also I think there's a sense of universalism right now. Your colleagues in India and France and North Carolina are all basically in the same position as you or me. Yes. Uh, and it's, this moment has actually brought us all together, literally, because here I am getting finally to have a conversation with you, thanks to Zoom. We met 10 years ago, but this is our first real conversation. But also, we all know that you, whether you're rich or poor or dark-skinned or light-skinned, you're basically facing the same challenge, which is the same opportunity now, as Aparna was saying, um, to, to remember what we've been missing in our lives, I think. That was such a beautiful conversation between the, t the three of you, and, and I'm really glad that we got a chance to, to share it with everybody today. Um, we have a couple of really good questions in the Q&A, and, and I would like to, to start with one of those before we share another special video. 
Um, so Rachel Cooper asks, how do you collaborate with musicians as an important component of your process? For example, your work with artists such as Rudersh Manhantapa, I hope I pronounced that correctly, or Amir El Safar. This too seems part of an American mosaic. Can you speak to this aspect of your work? Okay, I seem to be the starter in some of these here. Um, hello, Rachel. So nice that you could join us. And uh, we have a lovely talk at the Asia Society about one of our performances, Song of the Jasmine, several years ago. So um, definitely music and dance are two parts of a, of a whole for us and for, um, for our teacher, Alameda Bali, and the lineage we come from. Our teacher often says, you must see the music and hear the dance. And so we meet so many incredible uh, musicians and composers here in the United States. And when we feel a kinship uh, with our themes and our aesthetics, we pursue a collaborative project. And so within both of those instances, we did uh, start from scratch. We created a, an ensemble, a hybrid ensemble of both South Indian and jazz or uh, inspired jazz inspired uh, music together and created all of the work, the music and the dance in residencies together. And so really trying to very carefully layer both forms and make sure that we have a very unified um, message. And, uh, and, and of course, these are all embroidered around the themes that we are putting forth. So it's a, it's a, it's a brief answer to a more complicated question, but it is something that it gives us so much joy. And we have for many years been uh, fortunate to perform with live music. And so seeing the musicians, the musicians and the dancers together on stage, I think really enhances the experience for all of us. If I may add just one thing, um, all the, the, the musicians are of such high caliber, um, the musicians that we collaborate with and our musicians, that they are able to improvise a lot. I mean, that creativity makes it possible for us to work together. And so that is another very um, important uh, consideration to make to what kind of musicians are they and how are they going to work to, together. So the musicians themselves make the soundscape, which then makes a beautiful um, uh, place for us to do our choreography. In Fires of Varanasi, just to um, how we are, going through the historical aspects of Varanasi, where the Islamic music, the uh, Buddhist chants, the, all of the musical influences we have embodied in our work. So you can, it's not just uh, one, even though our, most of the musicians are Carnatic classical musicians, we have um, embroidered these elements to show the influences historically at Fires of Varanasi. Wonderful. Well, I want to make sure that we have time to show one more very special video. This is work that you all at Ragamala have done since your conversation with Pico, and it shows a lot of your rehearsal process, much of which happened outdoors outside Northrop over the course of the summer. So we'll take a look at that video, and then we'll come back for, for your comments about that process, and we can take some more questions from the Q&A.
So if you do see, watch, watch. And then the and the arms have to be much bigger. That's, yes, but you don't have to soften your feet. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. See, that you can't just turn the board from the whole arm, from the shoulder blade. The head has to come out. Taka dimi, taka dimi, taka dimi, taka jorn, taka dimi, taka jorn. Taka dimi, taka jorn, taka dimi, taka jorn. Even this, if you do this, if you do this, Give this space and give that space. have so many good questions in, in the q and I'm not sure if we'll have time to get to them all, but before we go there, Aparna and Rani, did you have anything that you wanted to say about that rehearsal video? Oh, um, I mean, there's so much to say. So I think just we were so thrilled to be able to all meet in person and have that beautiful space. And actually, it was just a coincidence that we had stairs that we could use, which of course we're, we're using as part of our set had already decided for Varanasi. So we were able to incorporate that. But just it was just so inspiring and it was very necessary for us. So thank you for making that possible. Oh, of course. It, it was wonderful for us to, to be able to bring something to the moment. So we were glad that you were able to work here and even in all of the elements that um, that you encountered in the summer. <laughs> Just saying, 
Ronnie and Aparna, it, it, it looks so interesting. I can't wait to see the, the, the piece performed in the theater. Actually, as you came down those steps, I was transported for a few seconds to, to, to Varanasi and the sound of the water in the background. The, the costumes are stunning. The vibrancy of the colors is just extraordinary. So engaging. So con congratulations. Look forward to seeing you in Washington at the Kennedy Center. Awesome. That's great. Thank you Thank so you. much. We're so looking forward to being there. Well, I think that we have time for one question and John and Ann Rosenwald uh, put one into the Q&A. They said, how do you two, Rani and Aparna, feel about the distance and age between you in your relationship to the Bharatanatyam tradition? And how do you, Aparna, differentiate that space from, from that between you and your younger sister, Ashwini? Oh, I'll take the first part. Oh, okay. Um, I think the, even though we are mother and daughter, we have had the privilege of studying together as students of the same teacher for almost for 35 years. And so in the art, art form is the most important for us in, in our entire lives. There we are almost same age. But it's interesting because I was when as we were studying with our teacher, I realized Aparna's talent. So I never um, uh, what do you call it, competed for that solo form. She was always the solo performer and I was always um, working on the back to keep up with her physical strength. Now, as an older person, I'm completely embodying the emotional, um, the strength of expressive dance, which I am cherishing and I'm hoping that I can continue this because I choreographed myself into the work, that I'll be able to do that and be alongside of Aparna for a long time. Mm. Oh, I, I don't know if there's much more to add to that. That's very sweet. Your sister. But, oh, I can talk about my sister. Well, I think um, what's really incredible about this experience that, that we have through our art form is, is this feeling of, of history and immediacy woven together and how it lives within us and courses through our veins. And so it's mother, daughter, and sister, yet we're part of such of a, this large lineage, this artistic lineage, this religious lineage, cultural lineage. And so I feel that all of us together have this living access to our own stories, our family stories and our cultural stories. And so it feels, it feels generational in some ways, but it also feels like we're connected to so much more than that. And our, um, and so it, it's just, it's been really beautiful experience to have these, to create these works that feel like they share our family stories, but also these stories that are much larger than us as well. And in a way that really captures our imaginations. Well, thank you so much for that beautiful answer. I wish we had a chance to get to all of the questions, but I think that we would probably be here all night. So, so instead, I will let everybody know about our, our next event in the Ragamal Root of Residency, which is on November 5th. It's titled Food for the Souls. Um, so I hope that you'll join us for that. I also hope that you will join us in DC in April and in the Twin Cities in May for the performances of Fires of Varanasi. So, Thank you so much, Ronnie and Aparna. Thank you, Alicia, for joining us and everyone from the Kennedy Center. All of you have a wonderful night and we will see you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. We loved this event. <laughs> <laughs> we did too. We're grateful for it. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night.